racial prejudice is what our, our kind of what we talk about, we're talking about implicit bias. So when we look at somebody, our brain has a reaction to that person, and if they are different from us in, in ways that involve race, that would be called racial prejudice. We have this reaction to them that's not rational, it's not based on experience, um, so we treat them differently than we would treat other people. But racism, really, if we define it, is a system. A system in which one group has advantages over another strictly based on race. So if you live in a society where there's a in-group or a dominant group and they have advantages that other people don't have, that's, you're in a racist system, basically. So we perceive people who are not like us as the out-group and people in the out-group perceive themselves as being excluded from being in the in-group. And there's nothing worse for our brains, no, nothing will get your brain upset more than when you feel you're being left out of something. We all want some sort of acknowledgement in our lives. In addition, we perceive these people who are not like us as the out-group, and we fear people who we do not identify as being a member of the in-group. And fear is a huge driver and a learned response uh, towards prejudicial behavior. When we were still living in, tr in small community groups and caves and so forth, that we wanted to protect our own, right? So when we saw other groups coming to us that were unfamiliar, we probably reacted to them to try to protect ourselves against them. Um, but of course, in modern society, that doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, and so it's a very primitive part of the brain that's having this reaction. Um, and it's, I, I'm sure, you know, in the animal world, we have something called altruism, where you're gonna protect people in your own family over, or your own group over other groups to, to kind of protect your DNA, if you will. Uh, but that doesn't make sense in a human society where we have you know, multinational, multicultural uh, interactions. People were shown unfamiliar faces of other white uh, people or unfamiliar pictures of people of color. It's the first thing our brain has to figure out is, what am I looking at? And there are areas of our brain that light up specifically in response to faces. And this is an area right here, uh, what you see lighting up, it's called the fusiform gyrus. Now, when these subjects were shown unfamiliar people of color's faces, something interesting happened. The first area to light up was not the fusiform gyrus. The first area that light up, lit up instead was the amygdala. Well, the amygdala does a lot of different things for us, and it's really important for memory and everything else, but it also helps us respond to things that we see as the threats versus challenges versus not, not threats. Um, so that lights up in, these, in people who see another person as a threat based on their race, for example. Um, but uh, it's a part of the brain that is involved in so many of the processes and is controlled by our frontal cortex. And so we can overcome that, again, using strategies. Most of us don't re respond violently, for example, to someone just because they look different from us. Not anymore, because we have this frontal cortex that can overcome and override that response. When we are in situations where we encounter people that are not like us, or in situations where people around us are treating us a certain way, uh, that is not good for us, we have chronic stress. Part of the thing that happens when we have chronic stress is there are hormones that are released into our bloodstream, and one of those hormones is cortisol. Cortisol is part of what everybody refers to as the fight or flight response. Cortisol is a hormone that really shouldn't stay high. It's meant to go up when there's a threat and then go away when the threat's gone. So if you're in a constant state of stress like that, it causes incredible damage to the body. High levels of cortisol have been implicated in weight gain, changes in metabolic system that lead to diabetes and metabolic disorders, uh, arthritis, decreased immune function, depression, hypertension, fatigue, problems with sleep and headaches, so-called tunnel vision, acid reflux disease, and hostility. Increased hostility and hypervigilance are all side effects of, of cortisol being high. My argument along those lines has been that racism uh, is a public health problem because it's causing this chronic stress and this chronic damage. And, and you know, it's, it's exacerbating uh, health conditions that would otherwise not be so serious. Now, there's a, something else that's really remarkable, um, and that is that there appear to be changes that happen to our DNA uh, as a result of exposure to types of stress. And these are referred to as epigenetic. What's striking is that some of these changes, these so-called epigenetic changes, um, can be passed down uh, to your children. So if you have a situation where stress from being in a situation of involving racism uh, is driving these epigenetic changes, you may be passing some of that down to your children. Now it's not clear how many generations that will go down, 
Um, and there's some suggestion that some of this could be reversible. Uh, so it's not, it's not a, a one-way path. Uh, uh, and all of us have, have somehow inherited epigenetic changes from our families. Uh, experiences. We've had people who've had stress over our, our generations, obviously. Um, but again, it's, it's a remarkable finding to suggest, again, that this is a real health problem. We need to really be aware of the uh, consequences of all of this. So I mentioned that if you're in a stressful situation, like being in a racist environment, your cortisol is going to be high. Well, what about racists? It turns out our body responds differently in terms of its physiological responses to challenges and threats. Challenges are good things, but threats actually do something different. They restrict blood flow to muscles and brain, and they release cortisol. Not only being a victim of racism can cause this high level of cortisol, but being a racist uh, you know, can, can do this too. If you're in a state where you're constantly feeling threatened by the people around you, your cortisol is also going to be high. So coming to terms, and again, this acquaintance with, with these people that are around you, if you have a relationship with them and, and relieve that stress, it's going to be better for you in the long run. So, it's, so this is bad for racists and for people who are victims of racism. But there's some good news. Coming back to that face recognition study I, I mentioned in the very beginning, if they showed an unfamiliar face to the subject, but before putting them in the scanner, show them a quick picture of the face and just mention maybe 20 or 30 seconds worth of information about that person, it was a face again. So a very small amount of familiarity really changed the way people looked about this. And there's some studies to suggest the same for the physiological reaction to being in the room with somebody who's, you have these attitudes, prejudicial attitudes about. A little bit of familiarity makes you see them as someone who's not a threat, so your stress levels don't go up. Uh, changes, physiological changes associated with stress like cortisol don't go up in your body. Um, so just a little familiar, familiarity seems to be the main thing. And that helps rewire you to understand not only that person, but sometimes even those groups of people. We make judgments about people and we can identify all sorts of features of people within a millisecond of seeing them. Our brains are not going to let us be colorblind, right? Color blindness is probably the worst thing we could try to do, even though that's what we were all told we were supposed to be doing. But in fact, what we need to be doing is, as institutions and as individuals is embracing the fact that there are differences and embracing the fact that people who have different backgrounds have different experiences and that maybe people who are in the in-group are not going to be very sympathetic of those experiences because they haven't experienced it. It's really important to have opportunities for people who have had similar experiences to come together and immerse themselves amongst people who have had similar experiences so they can openly talk about those experiences in a way that helps them understand what they've been through or what they want to have happen to them. Uh, but also immersion, the immersion step is also equally important. And I think this is true for everybody, not just people of color. I mean, it's true for everybody. Um, that they have this opportunity now to come back into this community and, and kind of you know, spread the news, if you will, you know, and be part of this conversation. And that's the thing, I think we need to keep on talking. There's familiarity, that's very important. But I think also just having these constant conversations, sometimes uncomfortable ones, that uh, allow people to understand everybody's perspective. Because I think too often we get ourselves, everybody does this, not just white people in this country or, or, or my country, but everybody does this. We, we have our own experience and view of the world. And when find someone tells you that something you've said or done is really hurtful to them, you don't understand it. And then you can never understand it unless they can articulate that. And the only way that's going to happen is for people to feel comfortable by immersing themselves with groups so they can have those discussions and then coming back and emer emerging and, and being part of the bigger community and the bigger discussion. I've had students come up to me after this, this talk from all white high schools. There's nobody, no kids of color at their high schools. This happens a lot uh, where I am. Um, and they're like, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this? And so I said, think about it. Think about every time you hear or tell a racist joke. You're, what's that doing to their greater society? Our brains uh, in, engage in prejudice all the time. Uh, and it may be minor, it may be major in terms of how we react to it. But racism as a practice is a learned behavior. It's not something that we just do because we can't help ourselves. And so if we can unlearn you know, racist tendencies uh, and, un and, and learn how to properly ad address the way our brain sees people, uh, I think we're all going to get along a lot better.